Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another opportunity for us at the Gateway Center for Israel to talk with some of our friends in this area that the Lord has given to us to steward, which is the area of Jewish Christian relations. And we're just, I'm excited today because uh, we're going to be talking with two people on the topic of something that I don't think is really discussed much anywhere. And so I want to introduce you today to two of uh, our friends here at Gateway, one new and one a uh, little bit older, but Rabbi Josh Lassard, Lassard and uh, Dr. Jennifer Rosner, who have just co-authored uh, a new book that is called At the Foot of the Mountain, Two Views on Torah and the Spirit, uh, and was uh, uh, the foreword for which was written by our very own Dr. David Rudolph here at the King's University. And so I want to encourage you, as you see the book here in front of you, to go out and find it. It's on Amazon or in any other place that you buy books. Um, but we're going to just get into that here today. But I want to start by, Josh, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and then you can throw it over to Jen, and you can do the same. All right, sounds good. First of all, Nick, thank you for having us on. We're excited about this conversation and excited about having more people join us in this conversation. Uh, so... Um, at the foot of the mountain started out, first of all, um, I should mention that uh, Jen and I are, are family. She, she married my brother several years back, and so we've had several family discussions, and uh, she's a, a professor at the King's University, and I'm just finishing up this summer my Master's of Divinity there, and I took her class in Messianic Jewish theology, which I thought was a wonderful class, very eye-opening on a lot of levels. Um, uh, but you know, as often happens uh, with with Jews, we we disagreed on a few things, and one of those things was, what exactly is the place of Torah, and more specifically, what's the place of the rabbinic interpretation of Torah in the Messianic Jewish movement? And um, she's on the more traditional side of that. And um, so anyway, after the class, we kind of emailed back and forth a little bit. And uh, I, I said, hey, you know, what if we, uh, instead of just emailing, what if we put this in a more presentable uh, format? And if the end product is, uh, is okay, why not have it published? And so uh, we started just uh, writing letters back and forth. You know, this is my view, uh, which, in my view, tends towards uh, the more um, freedom in the spirit, the more charismatic side of messianic Jewish expression, and, and hers the more traditional side. And and so we we just emailed back and forth, exploring different uh, aspects of that, challenging each other, and um, and we think the the end result is worth reading. We didn't come to any kind of consensus at the end, but still we, we maintained a uh, respectful dialogue. And I think what people will find is that um, whatever side you're on, or if you're undecided, if you read the book, I think you're going to think a little more deeply, or at least understand a few more aspects, a few more issues surrounding that central issue. What do I do with Torah? What do I do with law? What do I do with tradition? Uh, now that I have new life in the spirit, and, and what does that mean? So, Jen, um, in light of that, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, and then maybe you can start by by going over what your sort of position on this is. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nick. Um, so my name is Jen Rosner. I am a professor at a number of different schools, including the King's University, um, and I write in the Messianic Jewish world. I, I also have a popular, a more popular book um, geared towards Christians. Um, and so, yeah, this book was really born out of a class in which Josh was a student of mine, and we sparked this interesting conversation that we ended up being on um, on, on different sides of that sort of represent different streams within the Messianic Jewish movement. Um, Again, very meaningful that David Rudolph uh, at the King's University wrote the foreword to the book. Uh, and and yeah, so I, I think I represent, uh, again, a bit more of a traditionalist uh, view if there's sort of a spectrum within Messianic Judaism between more um, kind of leaning towards the Christian world and perhaps especially the charismatic Christian world versus leaning more towards the Jewish world. Both in my own experience and theological orientation, I would be a little bit more on the Jewish end of that, not the more traditional Jewish end of that spectrum, um, arguing that the coming of the Holy Spirit is very much in line with God's working 
all the way up until that point with 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 the people of Israel and the the birth of the church. Uh, and so not really a radical departure from that, trying to think in in lines of continuity about the coming of the spirit and what and what is new with the coming of the spirit, but also what uh, remains as a firm foundation that isn't um, sort of completely rethought or deconstructed um, because of that. So I think it's important to for, for me just to hit pause here and say that we're kind of already starting further down the road than maybe some people in our audience are familiar with, which is that Acts 2, the giving of the Holy Spirit, which occurs on the Jewish holiday of Shavuot, um, then the ensuing chapters in the book of Acts, was not God shifting his, uh, his intentions in moving, moving now people who put faith in Jesus away from continuing to live out in a Jewish, faithful, covenantal lifestyle, right? So... Um, what we're talking about here is what does it look like for Jewish people who put their faith in Jesus to continue living a Jewish lifestyle? Mm -hmm. And, and ultimately this is where, uh, there's a little bit of a disparity right between the two positions that you guys take. So, uh, why don't we just maybe walk through some of the practicalities of that? Um, you know, maybe starting with you, Jen, what, what would it look like in your point of view, uh, mm -hmm. for a Jewish follower of Jesus or Messianic Jew, uh, uh, what what would a lifestyle like that look like um, as far as kind of your position in, in a book? Yeah, I mean, well, I think one of the important points to, to sort of touch on in answering that question is the relationship between biblical Judaism and rabbinic Judaism. So we have, you know, all the biblical commandments and then the Jewish world has the tradition of rabbinic Judaism, much of which is written down in the Talmud, etc. Um, kind of arguing about what does it look like to be faithful to God's commandments in the Torah in the in the in the Old Testament, um, and so I uh, because I believe that God has continued to guide Jewish tradition that Jewish people are God's people, um, or at least a, a section of God's people these days. Um, in the in the aftermath of, of the coming of Jesus, uh, I th I believe that God has continued to guide Jewish tradition. So that's a bit of a dividing point in in Messianic Jewish conversations whether or not rabbinic Judaism is completely um, irrelevant for Messianic Jews because it's being developed by Jews who have rejected Mes Messiah or you know who who a, a tradition that's developing over against the Christian tradition. And so from my position. I think we do have to ascribe some authority to rabbinic tradition. Um, we have to kind of have a conversation, uh, be listening in on the conversation that the rabbis have been having for centuries, because that's that's the living tradition of what it means to apply the Torah to everyday life. Um, and so I, I would ascribe, some, again, it's nuanced and we get into this in the book, but um, I don't think we need to do everything the rabbis say because the rabbis say we should reject Jesus, which I don't think we should do clearly. Um, but I do think that 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 those are not mutually exclusive categories to ascribe ultimate authority to Messiah um, and to believe that Messiah is the full revelation of God. I don't see that as being mutually exclusive to ascribing some kind of authority to the tradition of the rabbis, which I believe has been led by God, despite its flaws. Um, and so it, it has to do with Jewish practice. Uh, it has to do with what we see as covenant fidelity as Messianic Jews being faithful to the covenant that God made with the people of Israel. And so it's not just a matter of personal preference. It's a matter of faithfulness, really. I mean, that's that's what's at stake uh, in terms of how we live our daily lives, which is really what rabbinic Judaism is all about. It's about structuring our lives and what we do and don't do with our bodies and how we structure our time and uh, those kinds of very practical uh, questions. Yeah. So, Josh, why don't you take it from there and then, and, and, you know, kind of what's your point of view on on what Jen said there? Right. Um, well, I um, I think the problem. Well, well, let me just say this as a caveat first. I I I, I have nothing against um, Messianic Jews living a traditional life. Um, I'm not uh, like Jen and my brother are. Uh, somewhat orthodox in their expression and and i have another brother who lives in israel who's quite orthodox in his expression nothing against that uh the, the problem i have is with ascribing for our entire movement 
uh, a, a desire to give authority to these rabbis because the very topic of their conversation, I believe, is, is different than the main thrust of messianic faith, right? So, so the main thrust for us is what does it look like now that Messiah has come, that he, the example for our lives is the cross, uh, the hope for our lives is the resurrection, the power for our lives is the Holy Spirit, uh, and rabbinic Judaism knows, knows nothing of that. Um, it doesn't mean that in some way maybe God wasn't guiding them along, uh, but just even if he was, even if God is does have his hand over rabbinic Judaism in some manner, is working behind the scenes through the Holy Spirit in some manner, and I say behind the scenes because they don't, to my knowledge, rabbinic Judaism doesn't uh, doesn't proclaim for itself that it's moving according to the Holy Spirit. Um, I could be wrong on that, but but however God's working there doesn't necessarily mean it's the way that he should work amongst those who believe, acknowledge, understand Messiah has come, been raised, poured out the Holy Spirit. Uh, so I'm not against interaction with the uh, rabbinic writings, uh, with um, mainstream synagogues. I am against them uh, dictating to us what the topics of conversation are. And, and just to give a quick example, um, you know, I was in a conversation with somebody once, probably a couple decades ago, and he was wrestling with this issue. And he felt like, you know, when I walk into a McDonald's, I need to at least have in my mind that normal Jewish thought, should I or should I not have a cheeseburger? Okay. All right. F fine. That, that, that's fine. But, um, but when that becomes the topic, rather than does God want me to sit next to somebody and share the gospel with them? I, I, I'm worried about rabbinic Judaism hijacking the topic of conversation. That is a really good example. So I, I want to take that example and think about this um, and ask you both, what type, I, I don't want to use the word precedent, but what type of example did, do you see in the scripture of this very thing happening? Because I think the book of Acts in large part uh, is us witnessing the very same conversation that I'm having with both of you right now. And it, it you know, obviously what made it onto the pages of our Bibles um, is a is a small portion of probably the conversations that were being had. But here you have this extremely faithful Jewish man, Paul, and you know, to an extent, obviously uh, Peter and James and the many other leaders in the in the first century, you know, movement of Jesus followers. And so, do do you feel like you're almost kind of picking up a conversation that was probably taking place off the pages in the first century? <laughs> I mean, I guess I'll jump in first on that one. Um, yeah, I think it's very relevant. I think it's very connected to the conversation and the decisions that are being made in the book of Acts. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that is so characteristic of the entire book of Acts is, is you know, the Holy Spirit comes on Jews at, at, at Pentecost, at Shavuot in Acts 2. Uh, and then, you know, Peter and the other disciples are astonished when it also when the spirit also falls on Gentiles that that kind of wasn't in their paradigm, despite the fact that they were like Jesus is in our circle. Um, and so I think much of the book of Acts is wrestling through what does it mean for Jews and Gentiles to to come together to sort of both be empowered by the gift of the spirit, which I, I would argue that the book of Acts does not thereby erase the distinction between Jew and Gentile. Um, it's Jews and Gentiles trying to figure out how to live together sort of as Jews and as Gentiles. And I think that the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 is a significant moment in this process because you know you have a question that I think is really um, jarring to us in our modern context, if we really think about it, which is do Gentile followers of Jesus have to take on Jewish practice? Like that is not generally a conversation that I've seen happening in, in most churches, but that was the topic, which I think, first of all, assumes that Jews are still living as Jews, that there's still, um, this kind of way of life that, uh, orients the life of the Jewish people and that the Jewish followers of Jesus did not have some radical departure from that. Uh, and that Jesus didn't model some radical departure from that as evidenced by this question that's raised at the Jerusalem Council. And the, the decision of the council is that aside from some very specific rulings, which, you know, 
scholars debate about why those four things and and I mean does it have to do with table fellowship does it have to do you know it, we're not I don't think we we definitively know the answer to that but the but the point is that Gentiles are not called to live as Jews but I think the assumption there is that Jews are going to continue to live as Jews and so then you get these very relevant questions about table fellowship and unity amidst um, diversity a, a kind of uni unity that I don't think means uniformity. I don't think that the book of Acts says Jews and Gentiles, um, their faith in Jesus looks exactly the same, which is why I think it's such a pressing question. How do we be in fellowship when we have these sort of different practices and different convictions and um, different different covenantal relationships with God in some sense. We're all in, in kind of under the arc of the one covenant, but I would say that looks a bit different for Jews and Gentiles. And so I think this is very connected to a conversation and, 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 a, and a set of issues that's, that's pressing in the book of Acts. Um, but I think that that connection is a bit obscured because that's not the questions that most Gentile Christians are asking when they come to the book of Acts. And so it's not immediately obvious, but I think when we kind of peel back the layers, this is precisely some of the key issues that, that, that the, the, the early followers of Jesus are wrestling with in the book of Acts. Right, right. And, and I don't, um, there's a lot that Jen just said that I uh, agree with. I, I do think this is a topic that was very much in discussion. I do think that Jews were continuing to, uh, Messianic Jews, Jewish believers in Yeshua were continuing to uh, live as Jews. I um, I think that Jen's presentation in the book, uh, you know, her her desire for distinction, not division, but distinction between Jews and Gentiles, is is a very strong point. I think that uh, if that were the main issue, you know, she she's won the debate. You know, I I can't tell my whole movement exactly where, when, and how, based on my theology, to maintain that distinction. Uh, my concern is when that distinction takes the place of, of other issues. For me, the foundational issue, and Jen asked me this in, this, in the book, and it was an excellent question, excellent uh, discussion we had. What is the... Uh, how, how did you phrase it, Jen? What, what's the the point of view? The the, the uh, I can't think of the exact term you used, but what's the what's the view that you have through which you see scripture, right? Because we all we all have it, whether we admit or admit it or we don't. You know, what is it that holds these sixty six books of the Bible together so that we can have something we call a theology and not just a, a bunch of random dictates and lessons and things? Uh, what gives us a cohesive theology is um, having a, a certain perspective um, that holds it together. And, and for me, that perspective is the glorification of, of the Messiah through, through the anointing of the Spirit. Uh, and, and I see the glorification of the Messiah being possible through a number of different ways. Uh, I can see Messiah being glorified through those who are more orthodox, that there's a certain message that Jen and her family portray that my family doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's certain people they can connect with on that level and, and testify to Yeshua that, that I couldn't because of my uh, less stringent uh, life, less observant life. Uh, at the same time, I, I believe that God is glorified uh, through other means as well. You know, take, for example, uh, uh, marriage, you know, to messianic jews marrying each other can testify to the world this is uh we are still jewish people god has been faithful to the jewish people and we're a testimony of that together and part of that testimony is that i married another jew uh, and that's great i i'm all for that testimony uh, whereas an intermarried couple, though, they can also have a testimony. This can also be of God. You know, we believe that in Messiah, uh, the dividing wall has been broken down. And especially if the, uh, the non-Jewish spouse is willing to uh, honor the Jewish heritage of the other, 
um, you, you have a testimony there of Jew and Gentile coming together as a, as a picture of the larger body of Messiah. And so, um, uh, and, and, and I would say that I think that my thrust here in the centrality of the gospel message, the centrality, uh, the, what motivates us and moves us is what motivates and moves acts along. You know, uh, people often talk about you know, Paul proclaims his, by, by, you know, the Acts 21 scene, he goes to the temple to prove he's not teaching against Moses. Uh, absolutely, definitely. But the bigger scene there is he goes to Jerusalem, not for the sake of the temple, but for the sake of administering, witnessing the gospel to his Jewish people. And so I, I'm just afraid because that's not a part of the rabbinic discussion, if they take too much of that uh, focus from us, that, that will lose really what the centrality of our faith is about. So, you know, what, what um, I really want to honor you both because you're living in a space that is not a, an easy place to live. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overly simplify this, but it, it's sort of like, Jen, you're, you're trying to find room right in the tent of Orthodox Judaism as a Jesus follower, and Josh, in some ways, I'm, again, the, please don't you know take this as like the boiling down of what I'm hearing. But you're in some ways, it kind of feels like you're trying to find room in more of the um, the uh, spirit empowered, you know, church movement with Jewish identity attached to it. And I, and I just want to say, you know, um, that I just really honor that in both of you that you're trying to create something that is trying to force you, you know, either suck, suck you into itself, and you're saying, no, <laughs> I don't want to be sucked in there, there's something else here, there, um, or, you know, that is where you just sort of don't get sucked in, but you just align with the thing that you're trying to make a distinction, and, and then you kind of shout across the, you know, side, the aisle at one another. So, uh, I just want to just say how much I respect what you're both trying to do, and it's, it's not easy, because, um, I think that's probably why we're still having this conversation is because in the end, after the first century, it just sort of became easier to just take the path of least resistance and for all Gentiles just to go full on Gentile and Jewish people to just reject Jesus. And it kind of, you know, I heard an, a scholar say one time that there is an element of supersessionism inside of both Judaism and Christianity and that um, after, after, you know, biblical Hebraic monotheism in the Second Temple period, you know, it, it was like the oral law of, of Jesus' followers was the New Testament, and the oral law of, of, of Jewish people was the, you know, the writings of the rabbis. And I, and I never thought about it like that, but it's kind of true. And so it can just be easier to live in this sort of mutual exclusivity of, well, I'm just going to go this way and forget about the other. So um, where, 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 do you envision the future of the messianic movement? I and mean, you both are younger and you're contributing your voice to this uh, conversation. So uh, do, do you, I know you're both trying to champion this conversation to happen inside of messianic Judaism. So where do, what do you envision the future looking like working together to continue to foster some sort of a, uh, you know, a united conversation on this? Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's a very important question. And, um, I've realized how bad I am at telling the future, you know, just with my own life. I don't know where the messianic movement is heading. I do know that this is a, a topic that we've got to grapple with, which is why we wrote the book, I think. Um, there's segments of messianic Judaism that just want to, uh, to ignore it, uh, and we can't do that. Um, I think that things became very complicated when the Messianic Jewish movement started to attract a lot of Gentiles. And I'm saying complicated, I'm not saying bad, I'm not saying I'm, I'm against that uh, at all. Um, there's a lot of member of, members of my family that are not Jewish and involved in the movement. And I, uh, I think, hey, great, that's, that's, I think actually that that models the way that the ecclesia, the, the church, and, and I know church has a decidedly un-Jewish ring, but I don't know what word to replace it with right now. Uh, body of Messiah, perhaps. I think that's the way that it, it should 
be that God, you know, Paul points out in Romans that, you know, the covenants belong to the Jewish people, you know, the oracles of God belong to the Jewish people, there should be a respect for the Jewish voice within the body of the Messiah. But I, I don't think that that Jewish voice is just for the Jews. I think, uh, you know, I'm not asking Gentiles to take on a Jewish identity, but I am saying that even Gentiles need to be listening for the Jewish voice because there's a history there that comes with, with a lesson um, and vice versa. I think Jews should be listening to the Gentile verse. What does it mean? Uh, as we see in Ephesians, to be those who are far away and then brought in. That, that itself has its own testimony. Uh, I'm, I'm off track here. So uh, the future of the movement. Um, my concern, and I, and I understand Jen's concern as well, I, I think, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, but Jen's concern is if we don't adhere and give some authority to the rabbinic voices are we following through on god's call for us to be a jewish movement um so i i understand that concern uh i would define i would define jewishness more more broadly uh that uh you know there like israel for example is largely secular but nobody would say it's un-jewish you know there's different types of jewish expression one of which is the rabbinic expression and for messianic jews so called to that god bless them I'll, I'll support them and pray for them in that way um, but there's a whole slew of jewish people in the world who need to know the jewish messiah and will be kept back from that message if they feel they have to start um donning to fill and they have to start for your Gentile audience, you know, uh, wrapping the phylacteries every day or, 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 or saying, you know, a hundred pages worth of prescripted prayers every day. And um, there's, there's a, an element of secular and less religious Judaism that needs this testimony. So what I would love to see in the messianic world is what I think we have now. And I just think we need to be spirit empowered to continue in that, which is diversity unity under the main tenets right the the main theological tenets the the full divinity of our messiah the outpouring of the spirit uh the greatest commandment of loving god and loving our neighbors um that god still has a place for israel that god has invited the the nations into covenant with him through the blood of the messiah you know these core tenets i feel are enough to hold us together as a movement and then to accept our brothers and sisters with various um, expressions of how that is based on their own background, it would it would feel unnatural in my own congregation for us to start acting orthodox. I, I don't have people that grew up orthodox. I've got uh, some Jewish people in the congregation, but well, one of them grew up orthodox, but um most of us did not grow up orthodox some of them grew up christian to start taking that upon ourselves i think is to try to portray a testimony from a place that we're just not at so i would love to see the unity over the core issues and then to allow for flexibility and freedom over uh things like what jen and i are talking about today yeah, I mean, I'll just answer my from my perspective briefly, and there's kind of three main points that I would like to make in response to your question, Nick. Um, the first is, and I think it's really important to touch on this, and Josh, Josh has touched on it in a couple of different ways um, in the book, and I think it's I think it's it's important to note that Josh and I know each other pretty well. I mean, we're related, like we know pretty much about each other's context, which is what made the book. Um, interesting to write because it gets very personal in places and there's uh places in the book where each of us kind of feels like well you're judging my way of being a jewish follower of jesus which is different than your way and i think it i hope it comes across strongly in the book that there is actually not judgment from either side so so josh is like wait but jen you're saying that all messianic jews should be orthodox jews and that's actually not what i'm saying and i'm thankful that josh raise that in the context of the book so that I had an opportunity to clarify my position, which is similar to Josh's. I think that there's, I think that there's room in the messianic movement for all manner of expressions. And I think that that's 
in the same way that there's sort of room in the body of Messiah more broadly for Anglicans and Pentecostals and all these different things, I would say the same thing for the Messianic movement. I think what makes my position a bit different from Josh's is that I would say there's inherent value in taking steps toward Jewish practice. If we believe that that's what God, that there's certain uh, practices that God has gifted to the Jewish people as a heritage, um, then there's then there should be some interest and some curiosity in in dipping our toes into that world. I mean, I wasn't raised in a, in an observant Jewish household. My the level of observance of my childhood was much much less than my observance today. And when I first started moving in like moving in Messianic Jewish circles, you know, I remember certain leaders saying, "Jen, just light candles on a Friday night. Like, just see how it feels. You know, fast on Yom Kippur. See how that feels." And I would say, I mean. Um, not that my relationship with Orthodox Judaism is, is, is straightforward. There's some complexity there and some tension and wrestling there, but I feel meaning to the extent that I take steps toward this very rich tradition of Judaism and the Jewish people. You know, when I, for example, fast on Yom Kippur or even Tisha B'Av, I feel a sense of solidarity with the Jewish people. And so I think there's inherent value in asking those questions, which is not the same thing as saying the entire Messianic Jewish movement needs to all be Orthodox Jews. That's the first point. Um, the second point uh, is that um, I think that the Messianic Jewish movement by and large lacks a robust pneumatology, a robust doctrine or understanding of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, you have in our day and age, lots of uh, different scholars who are starting to think through a particularly Messianic Jewish lens about different biblical and theological topics. And I think the Holy Spirit has not been, that the doctrine of the Spirit has not been delved into too deeply. Uh, and so my hope is that uh, this book would be a catalyst for the Messianic Jewish movement to wrestle more deeply with what do we make of the coming of the spirit? How do we make sense of these key events in the book of Acts? What do they mean for us today? Um, so I think that this kind of taking a step in the direction of sort of prodding conversations about the, the Holy Spirit in relation to the Torah, which is which is the main topic of the book. And my third point is just related to my first point, which is, you know, the, the, the Messianic Jewish, Jewish movement. I mean, there's, there used to be Hebrew Christians and then the movement intentionally sort of realigned itself as Messianic Judaism. And so I think if we're going to claim that title, and this is a place where I think Josh and I disagree, we need to have some basis upon which to call ourselves a Judaism. Um, and I would claim that that means we have to have some relationship to rabbinic Judaism other than just wholesale rejecting it. If we're going to claim to be a Judaism alongside Orthodox Judaism, conservative Judaism, reform Judaism, we have to sort of think through um, what does our relationship look like? And if we're going to intentionally depart from rabbinic Judaism, let's do it in a thoughtful, theologically articulate way rather than just a reactionary way, which is very much what you see in the Messianic Jewish movement in Israel, for example. So th that would be my hope. And also, you know, what I the, the kinds of conversations I hope that this book can uh, can spur on in the movement. And again, I just want to reiterate, it's not about judging. It's not about saying, well, my way of being a Messianic Jew is right and yours is wrong. Um, and, I, and I would be sad if anybody ended up taking that message from the book, because I think um, the book is about having a healthy, honest dialogue about differences while maintaining relationship and fellowship and, and recognizing some of the strengths of the other's position and the ways in which it kind of challenges me to think differently and, and, and hopefully vice versa. Yeah, well, um, I could keep talking about this probably for a couple more hours. <laughs> this is just so fascinating to me. I mean, I think we haven't even really scratched the surface on, you know, I think I mentioned this to you guys before we started recording, but I think from a from a pastoral perspective, one of the things that we uh, seem to run into uh, in an area of hesitancy as we're trying to help Gentile pastors understand how to affirm uh, Jewish identity uh, in their churches is that it's kind of this very same question. It's like, well, whose side are you on? You know, are, are you on the are you on the rabbi's side or are you on Jesus's side? You know, um, and. Uh, and I think I think we're just thinking about that wrongly when we when we try to make this dichotomy, uh, you know, uh, paradigm for people. Um, you know, our, our senior pastor, Pastor Robert, likes to say, 
that, you know, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Joshua and he said, whose side are you on? You know, he didn't tell him. He said, I'm not on anyone's side. I didn't come to choose sides. I came to take over, <laughs> you know. And so I think I think what I hear from both of you is so uh, it's so appealing because you're saying, obviously, we all serve one Lord who uh, will guide us into all these things. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, these things have to be worked out. And there's relational latitude in, in order to do that. And we live in a fluid world where so much history has changed the patterns and processes of, of how we all identify. And so I'd love to have another conversation with you guys at some point on this, maybe part two or something. Um, but I do want to just end by just saying how we, we at Gateway and, and, and as you know, leaders in, in the Gentile church, we want to affirm Jewish identity and um, we have a very clear statement on this that Dr. David Rudolph helped us create on our website that uh, e- expresses our affirmation for the fact that we believe it is the uh, sovereign choice of Jewish followers of Jesus to determine uh, what length at which they live their lives towards Jewish covenantal faithfulness or not. And um, so I kind of feel literally in between you guys <laughs> because, you know, we kind of affirm both, you know, and, uh, and and so it's a fun it's a fun place for us to live because we just want to affirm this conversation and affirm you both. And we believe God's leading you both. And we're, we're really grateful for how you're modeling it. So thank you both for your time. And uh, I do look forward to hopefully being able to have this conversation again in an ongoing fashion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sounds sounds wonderful. Thank you so much, Nick. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. All right. Well, everybody, thanks again. And um, uh, if you have any questions uh, on the backside of this interview, please send them to us, and we'll make sure that they uh, find their way to Dr. Rosner or, or Rabbi Josh. So have a great rest of your day.